In the Gilded Age of Boston's elite, where power and legacy were the ultimate currency, the Cabot dynasty once stood as the unchallenged kings and queens of unparalleled wealth, political might, and social sovereignty. Their influence was vast, their authority unquestioned, their affluence a dazzling beacon of old money grandeur that ruled the city's upper echelons with an iron fist. Yet, against the opulent backdrop of this formidable dynasty's reign, a figure lurked in the shadows, fueled by a mix of admiration and burning jealousy, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. You see, Joe Kennedy, a man of considerable ambition and cunning, was captivated by the Cabot's untouchable status, their every move dictating the social and political tides of Boston. It was indeed a world he desperately craved to conquer, not just for himself, but as a legacy to bequeath to his offspring. Thus, driven by a relentless envy and a visionary's foresight, Kennedy embarked on a relentless quest to dismantle the Cabot stronghold. He saw in his sons not just heirs to his name, but chess pieces in a grand strategy to usurp the Cabot's throne. With each calculated move, the Kennedys began their ascent, challenging the Cabots where they were strongest, on the political battlefield. Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., with a blend of charm and ruthlessness, groomed his sons for greatness, instilling in them the ambition to eclipse the Cabot's once unassailable position. In today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we share with you a 20-year campaign waged in the public eye and behind closed doors, where alliances were forged and loyalties tested as the Kennedy sons rose to prominence. And the Cabot dynasty's grip on Boston's elite slowly diminished, as we describe the old money family the Kennedys destroyed, the Cabot family dynasty. Swirling through Boston's history like a crisp New England breeze, the Cabot family planted their roots deep in the city's social and economic grounds since the turn of the 20th century. Dubbed as Boston Brahmins, the Cabots wove themselves into the very fabric of the city, blending a distinctive cocktail of finance, education and philanthropy with a twist of Harvard University, Anglicanism and the refined tastes of British American traditions. And in finance, the Cabots weren't just players, they were maestros. From their early days in the opium trade and privateering adventures, they laid the financial foundation that would steer Boston's economic ship for centuries. Thus, by the Roaring Twenties, they had their fingers in pies like the Beverly Cotton Manufactory and the Boston Manufacturing Company, not to mention the Cabot Corporation, painting them as pivotal figures in Boston's burgeoning industrial scene. But the Cabot's legacy didn't stop with dollars and cents. Their philanthropic pulse beat strongly through the veins of Boston's educational institutions. With hefty donations to Harvard, MIT, and the Massachusetts General Hospital, their generosity fed the minds and bodies of Bostonians. And the Cabot Family Charitable Trust and the Cabot Corporation Foundation sprinkled financial fairy dust across the arts, education, and health services, nurturing Boston's cultural and social landscape. Furthermore, owning landmarks and estates that dotted Boston's skyline, they etched their mark on the city's architectural history. For example, the Lewis Cabot estate, although now a whisper of the past, once stood an icon of Jacobethan architecture with a landscape kissed by Frederick Law Olmsted's genius. And their real estate venture, Cabot, Cabot and Forbes, sculpted the city's face with iconic landmarks, weaving the Cabot name into Boston's urban facade. Still, the Cabot saga continued with ventures that stretched beyond the confines of real estate. Their inception of Cabot Corporation, under the watchful eyes of Godfrey and Samuel Cabot, marked a leap into carbon black production, fueling the automotive and printing industry's ascent. And their influence didn't wane as the curtains rose on the 1940s. The Cabot legacy, particularly through Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr., wove its way through the fabric of American politics. You see, Lodge, Jr., a scion of this storied family and the future political rival of none other than John F. Kennedy, took the Senate floor, upholding a tradition of public service that was synonymous with the Cabots and Lodges. Indeed, his tenure wasn't just a political appointment. 
It was a chapter in the family's storied history, embodying their long-standing influence and connections within the echelons of American politics. Furthermore, his journey, again like his future rival JFK, traversed the battlefields of World War II, before eventually ending in the diplomatic corridors of the United Nations, Vietnam and the Vatican. However, before the Cabots could become a household name in one of America's oldest cities, Boston, they had to immigrate to what would become the United States, which is where we'll pick up in the next chapter. The story of the Cabots begins on the Channel Islands soil, particularly on the Isle of Jersey, where we find a story rich in history and soaked in the salty air of the sea. You see, this picturesque locale straddling the waters between England and France is well known to us Brits, but may not be so aware to modern Americans. Now, with a name that whispers of Norman ancestry, hinting at a lineage stretching back to the days following the Norman conquest of 1066, Cabot resonates with echoes of maritime adventures. Derived from Chabot, or Carbo, Norman dialect for bullhead, a fish, the family's name intertwines with the sea-sprayed environment of their homeland, hinting at their future seafaring exploits. So, John Cabot, born into this family in 1680 on the Isle of Jersey, embodied the spirit of adventure. Soon, in 1700, he set sail not just across the ocean, but into the future, landing in Salem, Massachusetts. This move was not merely a change of scenery, but a plunge into the vast possibilities of the new world, and it marked the start of the American chapter of the Cabot story, woven into the broader fabric of early American growth. See, the 17th and 18th centuries were marked by waves of Europeans seeking new beginnings in the Americas, driven by economic woes, religious persecution, and dreams of land and opportunity. Thus, for the Cabots and many others, America was a blank canvas on which to sketch a new family legacy free from the old world's shackles. And upon their arrival, the Cabots quickly found their sea legs in Salem, turning their maritime heritage into a commercial empire. Therefore, the early 1700s saw the family commanding a fleet of ships engaged in trade and, on occasion, in the murkier waters of opium, rum and slave transport. The Cabot family's involvement in trade was multifaceted, including legitimate business ventures as well as participation in the more controversial and morally dubious trades of opium, rum and enslaved people. Their foray into the opium trade particularly underscored their role in broadening opium supply lines to China, a venture fraught with profit and geopolitical tensions. This endeavour, therefore, not only bolstered their coffers, but also nudged the British East India Company into protective stances, precipitating the opium wars as the Chinese sought to curb opium influx. Specifically, Charles Cabot, a sea captain from Boston, epitomised this audacious spirit, seeking opium in East India Company holdings to sell in Eastern markets, aiming for the lucrative advantage of being first. Such manoeuvres by the Cabots and other American traders significantly dented British dominance in the trade, especially in the Turkish opium sector, fostering the Malwa opium trade's expansion. Moreover, the Cabots' engagement with the rum trade was emblematic of their multifaceted business interests. You see, rum, distilled from Caribbean molasses, was a pivotal element of the triangular trade, linking the Americas to Europe and Africa in a complex web of commerce that included the sorrowful exchange of enslaved individuals and raw materials. Therefore, there is no denying that this trade system, in which the Cabots were deeply embedded, was a cornerstone of their wealth and influence. The Cabot's involvement in the slave trade thus marks a somber facet of their legacy. Figures like John and Joseph Cabot, though celebrated as astute merchants, also partook in the grievous trade of human lives. And this participation was not isolated, but part of the broader engagement of New England's elite in the transatlantic slave trade. Consequently, as maritime commerce flowed through the arteries of Boston's societal elite, the Cabots emerged as prominent figures, 
their shrewdness and enterprise anchoring them as titans of the shipping industry. It was from this foundation that the Cabots would, like so many old money families, leverage their way to the top of the political heap in Boston, starting with George Cabot, who we'll meet next. George Cabot's entry onto the political stage, born in 1752, marks a notable chapter in the Cabot family saga, and his journey further enriched the family's coffers, but his legacy is largely painted by his political endeavors. You see, George emerged as a pivotal figure within the Federalist Party, the Essex Junto, and the Hartford Convention, showcasing the Cabot's knack for intertwining with the nation's political threads. And his roles, particularly as a U.S. Senator from Massachusetts and the inaugural, albeit unwilling, Secretary of the Navy, highlight the Cabot's deep roots in America's political landscape. But their engagement in politics stretch beyond mere office-holding to influencing the nation's trajectory, pushing for a robust federal government and policies that buoyed their commercial ventures. And in the social realms of the 19th century, the Cabot matriarchs embroidered philanthropy and community engagement into their legacy, stretching their influence well beyond the mere confines of wealth. These women, firmly interwoven into Boston's societal fabric, leveraged their positions not for idle luxury, but for spearheading social initiatives and championing community welfare. For example, Elizabeth Cabot, who married into this illustrious family, stands out for her commitment to social betterment, particularly in championing the welfare of children and the underprivileged. Her endeavors were not solitary gestures of kindness, but part of a wider crusade by women of her stature towards social reform, in an era when women's public roles were blossoming into significance. And in the healthcare landscape, the Cabot matriarchs played a pivotal role, particularly with their foundational support for the Massachusetts General Hospital. This institution stands as a pillar of medical excellence in the United States, much of its early strength derived from the Cabot family's generosity and strategic guidance. Education, too, felt the touch of the Cabot matriarch's generosity. Their unwavering support for institutions like Harvard University helped sculpt the educational fabric of the region. But their vision went beyond prestigious academia. They championed educational and vocational training for women, underpinning the belief that empowerment through education was crucial for societal advancement. But the Cabots also made their mark on the arts and culture, notably through contributions to the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Recognizing the essential role of arts in a thriving society, the Cabot matriarchs ensured Bostonians had access to unparalleled artistic and cultural experiences, viewing such endeavors not as mere embellishments, but as societal necessities. For instance, Godfrey Lowell Cabot's establishment of a charitable trust carried the family's philanthropic legacy into the 20th century and beyond, supporting an array of causes from the arts to health services. This enduring trust mirrored the Cabot matriarch's deep-seated commitment to societal enhancement, a legacy of philanthropy that cascaded through generations. Therefore, the Cabot's enduring influence, transcending their era, set a benchmark for the Boston elite and the Cabot descendants. Through their dedication to social causes and community well-being, they showcased how wealth, when guided by compassion and civic duty, becomes a potent force for social progress. Little did they know, however, that this is the same playbook that a then little-known Irish immigrant family would use to come to the absolute zenith of American power just a few years later. Which is where we meet the Kennedys in the next chapter. At the dawn of the 20th century, Massachusetts became the arena for an unfolding rivalry that would etch its way into the political annals of the state, starring two formidable families, the Cabots and the Kennedys. And this rivalry was not just a matter of electoral contests, it represented the clash of two distinct societal forces. On one side stood the Cabots, a name interwoven with the fabric of American history emblematic of the Boston Brahmin elite. This group, 
composed of old New England Protestant families, was celebrated for its long-standing influence in realms ranging from business to politics. Contrastingly, the Kennedys, a family of Irish Catholic immigrants, carved their path to prominence through political shrewdness, entrepreneurial spirit, and an indefatigable pursuit of achievement. The early political skirmishes between these dynasties transcended mere quests for office. They mirrored the broader societal and religious divisions of the era, with the Protestant establishment's old guard, epitomized by the Cabots, juxtaposed against the burgeoning political ambitions of the Irish Catholic faction, personified by the Kennedys. Thus, this rivalry was emblematic of the tectonic shifts in American society as newer immigrant groups vied for recognition and influence within the country's political and social weave. Now, a pivotal moment in this familial duel was the 1952 Senate race, a contest that not only highlighted the political ambitions of these families, but also underscored the evolving dynamics of American society. This election pitted John F. Kennedy a vibrant, forward-looking Democrat with eyes set firmly on the future, against the aforementioned Republican incumbent Senator Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., whose roots in Massachusetts politics and public service by then already ran deep. Specifically, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. had represented Massachusetts in the Senate since 1937, pausing only to serve in World War II. Returning to the Senate in 1947, he became a staunch advocate for internationalism, particularly amidst the Cold War's chill. And Lodge's tenure was marked by his support for a globalist foreign policy and his pivotal role in urging Dwight D. Eisenhower to run for the presidency under the Republican banner in 1952. Yet, despite his commendable track record and the weight of his family's name, Lodge found in John F. Kennedy an adversary whose family's rising star in American politics could not be underestimated. JFK, emerging from the burgeoning Kennedy clan, was the embodiment of a fresh tide in political leadership. His family's Irish Catholic heritage became a beacon for the dreams and aspirations of immigrant communities across the United States. And Kennedy's campaign strategy shone with ingenuity, harnessing his family's escalating financial might and knitting together a tapestry of support among Irish Catholics and other immigrant groups. Moreover, this election highlighted the transformative nature of political campaigning in America. Kennedy's proficient use of nascent media channels, coupled with his magnetic public persona and the strategic deployment of his family's assets, set a new benchmark for electoral campaigns. Thus, the 1952 Senate race emerged as a critical juncture reflecting deeper social and political transformations in post-war America, heralding a new chapter with the Kennedys at the forefront of national destiny shaping. But the narrative of the Cabots versus the Kennedys extended into the 1960 presidential race, again seeing Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. as Richard Nixon's running mate against John F. Kennedy. This rematch, up the ante to involve the nation's highest office. And after his shocking defeat, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. brought an enlarged resume filled with more notable appointments, including US Ambassador to the United Nations. Despite his formidable background and the prestige of the Cabot name, the Lodge Nixon ticket did not prevail, leading to a narrowly won Kennedy victory that would significantly impact both families and the broader American political landscape. Thus, Kennedy's ascendancy to the presidency in 1960 was a pivotal moment, propelling the Kennedys from national prominence to a dynastic stature within the heart of American politics. Then, in a twist of fate that seemed almost scripted for the annals of political history, the Cabot and Kennedy dynasties found themselves once again at the forefront of Massachusetts politics just two years post the iconic 1960 presidential election. Indeed, the 1962 United States Senate special election in Massachusetts set the stage for yet another face-off between these storied Boston families. You see, George Cabot Lodge II, a Republican, entered the fray against Edward M. Kennedy, the youngest scion of the Democratic Kennedy family, who was already basking in the glow of his brother's presidential success. But George C. Lodge, ironically the son of Henry Cabot Lodge, Jr., 
faced the daunting prospect of challenging a Kennedy. Having seen his father defeated by JFK in not just one, but two pivotal political battles over an eight-year span. George, however, was no stranger to the demands of public service. A veteran of the US Navy and a Harvard College alumnus, Lodge had carved out a career as a political reporter and columnist before venturing into the federal civil service, culminating in his role as Assistant Secretary of Labor for International Affairs. Thus, his campaign was a blend of academic acumen and seasoned political insight. In the other corner, so to speak, Edward M. Ted Kennedy was thrust into the political limelight following his brother's vacating of the Senate seat for the presidency. And despite initial hesitations regarding his youth and relative inexperience, Ted Kennedy's campaign leveraged the Kennedy family's immense popularity and financial clout. His campaign's innovative tea parties, orchestrated by his mother, significantly bolstered his appeal, particularly among women voters. Therefore, the 1962 campaign trail was a spectacle of strategy and familial prestige. Lodge, conscious of his revered family background, steered clear of critiques centered on dynasty, instead positioning himself as a forward-thinking moderate Republican. Kennedy, meanwhile, tapped into the formidable Kennedy political machine, embarking on an exhaustive campaign tour across Massachusetts, aiming to reach voters in every corner of the state. However, despite Lodge's formidable efforts and political pedigree, the backdrop of the Cuban Missile Crisis and the soaring approval ratings of the Kennedy administration posed insurmountable challenges. Edward M. Kennedy emerged victorious, securing 55% of the vote to George Cabot Lodge's 41.85%, a win that not only extended the Kennedy political legacy, but also marked the third defeat of a Lodge by a Kennedy in less than a decade. The 1962 special elections reverberations were thus profound and lasting for both families and the broader American political landscape. Ted Kennedy's Senate career spanned nearly five decades, during which he championed significant legislation across civil rights, education and healthcare, cementing his legacy as one of America's most influential legislators. George C. Lodge, on the other hand, transitioned to an illustrious academic career making notable contributions to international economic development as a respected professor at Harvard Business School. As the Kennedys navigated the highs and lows of their public journey, the Cabots pivoted, focusing their energies on business and philanthropy, thereby carving out a new niche for themselves in American society. The Cabot lineage, a story woven into the very core of America's economic and political realms, charts a journey from their ascendancy as enterprising merchants, engaging in the rum trade and the inhumane traffic of enslaved individuals, to their ventures into the lucrative opium market. Their prosperity and intricate network of connections propelled them to significant political heights, with figures like George Cabot steering the Federalist Party and the Hartford Convention. Marriages with other affluent Boston dynasties further solidified their position within the esteemed Brahmin class, a cadre of families wielding vast influence across Massachusetts and beyond. Yet, as the 1980s dawned, the tides of change swept across the United States. An era marked by economic upheaval, burgeoning social diversity and pivotal political shifts it heralded the decline of manufacturing stalwarts and the rise of the tech and service sectors. Therefore, this period saw the American social fabric becoming increasingly variegated, with shifting immigration patterns altering the demographic landscape, especially in regions like New England. The political arena, too, was in flux, characterized by the ideological shifts of the Cold War's twilight and the neoliberal wave under Reagan's presidency, reshaping governance and public discourse. Within this evolving backdrop, the Cabots and their peers faced diminishing traditional avenues of influence. The economic clout they once wielded was now contested by the fortunes amassed in the burgeoning tech and service industries. The societal leverage they enjoyed was thus diluted amidst the growing diversity and evolving societal norms. 
and politically, the emergence of a more polarized environment eroded the middle ground where the Cabots had historically exerted their sway. Confronted with these transformations, the Cabots endeavored to recalibrate and sustain their standing. They persisted in their philanthropic missions, directing their largesse towards education, healthcare, and cultural initiatives critical to America's societal framework. The Cabot Family Charitable Trust, for example, emerged as a testament to their adaptive strategy, focusing its efforts on bridging the gaps left by other programs and addressing the needs of a diversifying community. Through these endeavors, the Cabots sought to navigate the shifting sands of time, aiming to preserve their legacy amidst the changing tides of American society, economy, and politics. Frank Cabot, a descendant endowed with the family's financial wit, veered from the conventional route of finance to forge a significant mark in horticulture and garden conservation. Born in August 1925 in New York City, his life's work would become a symbol of a profound shift from finance to the forefront of garden preservation. For example, in 1989, he founded the Garden Conservancy, a beacon for safeguarding America's horticultural jewels, safeguarding nearly 100 gardens across the country. Parallel to this verdant legacy, the Cabot's prowess in real estate development through the aforementioned Cabot, Cabot and Forbes cemented their influence in shaping urban landscapes. Since its inception in 1904, the firm has been a cornerstone in the creation of over 100 million square feet of commercial space, molding the skyline with Boston landmarks such as One Boston Place and 60 State Street. Consequently, the endeavors of individuals like Frank Cabot, alongside the family's ventures in real estate, paint a picture of a family that adeptly merges tradition with innovation. As they steer through the currents of change, their enduring commitment to enhancing both the natural and built environment ensures their legacy flourishes, contributing to the societal tapestry with each passing generation. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Are you a native of Massachusetts? And had you heard of the Cabot family before? We look forward to your thoughts. And thanks again for joining us for another episode of Old Money Luxury. Cheers, until next time.